you may know I'm a wildlife filmmaker based in Bristol, uh, and I often talk about how we made Planet Earth 2, I often talk about why we made Planet Earth 2, but what I want to do today um, as a side theme, because we've got such a long session, is I want to talk to you guys as a quite an intelligent audience about a much deeper theme, and that's whether these big Attenborough blockbusters actually do anything to help conservation. Um, now, I also want to ask as we go, would it have been a richer experience as we watch those images to know that that pygmy sloth, the one swimming, is on the very edge of extinction, or to know that those great caribou herds that we saw migrating, that might be the last footage that we ever get of those massive migrations because they're in such decline. Would it have made it a richer experience had we know, had that information as we were watching? Now, I was in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia, and I was lucky enough to get a, onto a chat show. By that stage, I could speak a little bit of Amharic, the local language. And I was able, in that 30 minutes, to talk to uh, Ethiopians about why gelada was so special, why I'd come from the other side of the world to study them, that they were only found in Ethiopia. And the response was, was utterly remarkable. The next day, I was out on the street, and uh, locals would come up to me and say, oh, you're that monkey man. I saw you on television. I didn't realize that gelada were only found in Ethiopia. They honestly thought that gelada were vermin all over the world, just like rats and cockroaches that everybody was trying to get rid of. Now, to cut a long story short, we did have to come up with a compensation scheme to compensate farmers. But what was interesting was that we, we discovered that not as many crops were actually being raided as was being claimed. Um, but we did find a solution. But the big point of the story for me was that in that 30 minutes on Ethiopian television was an absolute epiphany because I had done more good for the gelada in 30 minutes than I had in three years of studying them. Up until that stage, I'd had no interest in media whatsoever. I just wanted to be an academic biologist. But I managed to uh, borrow a second-hand camera, and I started filming the monkeys more and more. And, and basically, well, I think uh, for the, the PhD that took me four years to write, I think probably four people in the world ever read it. Or actually, I think it's probably three and a half, because I really don't think my dad ever finished it. <laughs> but I don't, I don't really blame him. But then the first film I made about gelada baboons, probably 40 million people around the world saw that. So that was the real, uh, as I say, epiphany for me about the power of media, and especially television, to reach people in positive ways. So after some time as a scientific consultant for the BBC, I helped them in the Horn of Africa region uh, and a few more Ethiopian projects. My first chance to work with them um, somewhere outside of my comfort zone came up on this series that some of you might have heard of, the original Planet Earth. Now, this was uh, 12 years ago, 13 years ago now. But what um, blows my mind in that short amount of time, there was not one word of conservation in this entire series. 11 parts, some of you might have seen it. I doubt many of you remember it all. But not one single sentence about conservation. And what's remarkable about that, only just over a decade ago, is that no one said a thing. Not one single viewer. It's been seen by 500 billion people around the world. And it's owned by more people. This DVD box is owned by more people around the planet than any other DVD uh, in the world. It's kind of like the, the Michael Jackson thriller of DVDs. Not that that's very PC these days, but I don't, I don't, maybe he doesn't hold the record anymore. But anyway, more people own this DVD box than, than any, any other DVD on the planet, and yet zero conservation message in it. So anyway, I was uh, you know, hoping for some glamour on this series, and my first trip uh, on there was to this place. This is one kilometre underground. We went into the most filthy and stinking caves that I've ever worked in in my life, or ever visited, uh, Gomantong Caves in Borneo. And our job there was to film the world's biggest pile of poo here. This is hundreds of years of bat droppings that have accumulated to be hundreds of meters high. And what we're trying to do is to roll a camera on a cable up and down uh, this, this pile of poo to try and give you a sense of the scale. Now, this is the first time that I was dressing up here in a paper suit to keep all the creepy crawlies off me. And somebody put a camera in my face, and this is the first time I had any exposure to a making of. I didn't know what a making of was at this time. Uh, and basically, I spent about 10 years being known as the guy covered in bat shit. That was my claim to fame, no matter where I went in the world and what I talked about, all the other work I was doing. People were like, oh, yeah, you're the guy in that making of, the guy covered in bat shit. So basically, it's taken me about a decade to, uh, to shake that, that um, title. 
Now, so that was only 13 years ago, and as I said, no conservation in that series. I'm not sure if any of you can guess what the first major Attenborough series was that we really did have a full environmental episode in, but I'll spare you guessing. It was Frozen Planet. Now, when we came to make Frozen Planet, we realized that we just couldn't get away with it. The polar regions are changing faster than any other habitat on Earth. So we knew that we needed to talk about that in some way. Now, at the time that Frozen Planet came out, we were very scared about putting conservation in most of the main body of the series. So what we did is we, we tried to um, not lure you in, but we tried to entertain viewers with six hours of penguins and polar bears before we got to the seventh episode uh, and, and did our environmental message there. Now, this was to film Emperor Penguins. This is very, very remote in Antarctica, hundreds and hundreds of miles from any other humans. We had to get dropped off with a ski plane and all of the stuff that we would need for four to five weeks of living on the ice, all of our, our tents and food. And you can see the emperor penguins, who have absolutely no land predators, totally curious, and they've already come up to check us out just as we're unloading the plane. Uh, in fact, they took such a, this is a group of bachelor penguins that took such a shining to our luggage. In fact, I think my Samsonite suitcase here, from the right angles, has, has kind of the dimensions of a sexy emperor penguin lady. <laughs> and so most of these bachelor guys have come to chat up my Samsonite suitcase. <coughs> But the wonderful thing about working with animals that aren't scared of humans is that, of course, we can get right in there amongst them. This cameraman, John Aitchison, uh, you can see is using a, a tripod only 20 centimeters high. And he basically spent the five weeks wearing skateboard kneecaps and spending that entire five weeks on his knees. Because what he's trying to do <coughs> is film at the eye level of the penguins. What we're trying to do is always take you into the world of the animals that we're filming. It's something that you'll notice in Hollywood or you'll notice in TV dramas, the way a camera will, will generally be at the eye level of the actors. And so you might not notice it as much in wildlife, but if we're filming elephants or we're filming harvest mice, we basically are always trying to take you to the level of the eyes of the animals to take you into their world. Uh, so here we are doing it with the emperor penguins. Now, their wonderful value up on ice, uh, waddling around you, inc you know, incredibly comic. In fact, a, a scientific paper came out recently proving that fatter penguins fall over more than thinner penguins, which is just great. I have no idea how they got money to do that research, <laughs> but it is scientifically official. You can go to the pub tonight and tell your mates that it's official. Scientists have proven that fatter penguins fall over more often. But while they're kind of clumsy and comical up on top of the ice, when you see them underneath the water, you realize how unbelievably marine adapted they are. They are just, they are just magnificent beasts underwater, made for it. In fact, I think if penguins didn't need to come ashore to lay eggs, if they could evolve a way to lay their eggs out in the ocean, they would just stay out there forever. They'd be delighted. The only reason they come ashore is because of the, the annoying young. So there they are um, out you know, doing their thing, d diving. These penguins are diving to 500 meters depth and holding their breath for 20 minutes at a time which absolutely blows my mind. I mean, you're th it's pitch black down there, for half a kilometer down into the coldest waters in the world, pitch black, and they go down there, they slow the heart rate right down and go for 20 minutes. But what blows my mind is, is to remember that that's a bird, that's a bird diving to, to half a kilometer for 20 minutes. So they're, they're utterly uh, magnificent underwater. Um, and when they come up to the surface, obviously we can't go that deep. This is us near the surface. <clears throat> we start seeing them come up through the, the depths as little, little uh, pinpricks and they get bigger and then they start orbiting around us. Now they do have predators in the ocean. There are orcas and leopard seals uh, and so they're a lot more wary in the water. And of course you can see the way, you know, as divers we probably look a little bit like a leopard seal. So most of these penguins are staying well away from us and underwater you have fairly wide angle lenses anyway so we couldn't get close images. You can see one here who's just squeezing his feathers to release, he's got air bubbles trapped under there for insulation on the dive and getting to the surface, just squeezing out the air. So I took this picture of the cameraman just before we came to the surface. We're also able to use stabilized camera rigs. Um, this is one, uh, a handheld rig where the, the camera sits in the middle and has these spinning gyro motors so that if you move <clears throat> the handles around, it keeps the camera rock steady. You might see, have you might see steady cams running up and down the side of rugby pitches or football. It's that similar technology, but finally it'll become small enough for us as wildlife filmmakers to use. And I'm not a cameraman, by the way. I was just the only Muppet willing to sit on the front of the Land Rover while they hurtled across 
the Savannah. This is one of my favorite trips up to the Arctic North, uh, way above the Arctic Circle. We're there to film these wonderful animals, caribou. These are female caribou that have gone on the world's longest land migration uh, to carve. They're basically trying to push as far north as they can get um, to drop their calves, trying to get away from bugs and trying to catch new growth. We're so far north that this is, this is Midsummer's Day up there and we even got kind of caught with snow flurries. Now a lot of people, especially people who are interested in wildlife filmmaking, ask about the facilities on shoots. And so I'm glad to take the time to report that they look a little bit like this. Now I'd ask the cat manager for a little bit of privacy, but don't skimp on the view. And I was kind of hoping for a view of this beautiful blue frozen uh, river in the background. So I was a little bit miffed that the, uh, the, the dunny was pointing the other way. But it only took me one long contemplative sit to realize that what he had given us was a herd of muskox. He was this beautiful ice age animal grazing right out in front of the loo which created quite a cue for the loo um, because it was just kind of hard to take your eyes off them. Now, when we're out on wildlife film shoots, we spend a lot of time uh, scouting. We split up, we might go looking for animals, we might go looking for good filming locations. We spend a lot of time basically researching the area and getting a feel for it. So I was out on uh, one of these solo uh, scouting afternoons on my own quite peacefully when I realized actually that I wasn't that alone. Now, you don't need to be much of a biologist to realize that whatever had just left these prints probably could do a bit of damage to you if you bumped into them face to face. So I think, I think kind of I want to wrap up by suggesting that if there's one key piece of evidence that I could bring to, to suggest that these, these big Attenborough series do do something for the natural world, it's the fact that we have series like Life on Earth back in 1979 to thank for the fact that I'm standing here today talking to you guys. And so for me, as a filmmaker, my hope with making things like Planet Earth 2 or Blue Planet 2 is that out there there's a new generation of seven-year-olds that are so excited that they're climbing up their sofas and watching them so excited and wanting to be that next generation of conservation bio biologists and wildlife filmmakers. And so on that note, thank you very much for listening. <laughs>